Ross, how are you? It's great to have you. Hey, Mike, uh, doing very well, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. No problems at all, Ross. I have to say, when I, when I read what, what you've done, I couldn't wait to get you on. Um, you've, you've done coast to coast in the, U, in the US. <clears throat> Um, you've done the Reno Air Races, you've done the Dakotas, uh, you've done Houston to San Diego, and your biggest one at the moment is you've done a, you're, you're on a expedition to fly a single engine piston aircraft around the world. Um, from what I believe is at the moment, you've done 327 hours flown since leaving. You've done 41,658 miles uh, so far, 30 countries and 174 airports. Uh, yes, yeah, that's right. Um, and actually, those date, those statistics are uh, as of October last year. Okay. Uh, the the website is still not quite up to date, so I'm working on uh, working on updating that right now. Um, I'm expecting about another uh, another fifty hours, maybe a little more, to have been added to those totals flying around Australia. Wow. <laughs> that must have been amazing. I'm. Look, we'll, we'll go to the start, and I always ask people to this the same question is how did your interest in aviation come about or how did you get into aviation i think really it was the stereotypical um small boy interested in airplanes story um nobody in my immediate family um were involved in aviation in, in any way but while i was young i had a fascination with aircraft i used to spend hours and hours on microsoft flight simulator um, flying here and there and then once I was at university, I finally meant, got to the point where I'd uh, saved up a bit of money and the exchange rate to the US dollar was particularly good. Um, so I had the chance to go over to the States for a few weeks and uh, got my license and really it just went from there. Brilliant, brilliant. You, you've, as, as we've said, you've an impressive array of, of touring. It sounds like just bashing out a few circuits doesn't really keep you happy. Where, where did the love of touring come from or, or what point when you had a license did you think oh, I want to do this and I want to go there and I want to go further afield so before I even had my license um, like I said when I was playing on flight simulator a great deal I, I used to love cross-country flights on there not entirely sure why but I, I set out to fly around the world on flight sim when I was about 13 years old um, and that was good fun, tracking it on a map and deciding where to go next. Um, and then once I was taking, uh, doing my private pilot's training out in Florida, I really enjoyed the cross-country flying. And I just thought every time I had to turn around and come back, I thought to myself, oh, I wish I could have kept. And thought, well, I've got a got a few months off now. Why don't I just try and uh, see if I can fly across the US and back? Brilliant. <laughs> um, found someone who was crazy enough to rent me an aircraft, and off I went. Fantastic. And what did you, did you find it daunting at first, or um, a little bit daunting? Yes, uh, I won't deny that. Um, it, it was about two years after I'd received my PPL. Uh, and in that time, I'd been flying with the University Air Squadron in the UK. And they had given me some, some really good training. And, and that was quite helpful in terms of confidence building. Um, I think the really important thing was that we set off on this flight across America with camping gear in the back. Um, so didn't care where we landed. We knew that we weren't going to be uh, stranded with nowhere to sleep. And we had no particularly fixed agenda. The, the target was reach the West Coast. Um, I had five weeks or so to do it, so we weren't tempted to push on through poor weather or, or dangerous conditions. Brilliant. Because I know a lot of people that get, like, I think I kind of get home itis when they just push on through absolutely anything, and it, it, it's not, absolutely not and to see. No, no, and it's always uh, such a such a strong influence that get home itis even now um, i find that if i've really been planning a flight for a long time and i'm all prepared and everything's ready to go it takes serious willpower to turn around and say actually no not today yeah 100 percent. i get it with myself as well it's it's a uh, we had a we had a situation where we're coming back up through france in 2018 and uh, both of us were trying to get home for work um, two days in, into the or when we left we had two days to get home um, before both of us were in work and it was okay. better moving in so everything was against us and lucky enough now we didn't have to go through any bad weather or anything like that but any little hiccup it would have scuppered our plans and put us into that kind of bracket of I know what you mean not go. I, I had the same experience myself after flying down to uh, Tunisia um, back in 2010 
coming back through France on my way, had to be back at work on Monday. Um, and the weather just turned and we had to land at the closest airport. It changed that quickly. Wow. Got that stuck there for three days. So on the Monday morning, I had to phone my uh, manager and say, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, won't be able to get into work today. Um, my flight was cancelled because of weather. And he said, oh, no problem. No problem. See you when you get here. And he phoned me back about 30 minutes later and said, hang on, didn't you fly yourself? <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. Thankfully, he it. was quite understanding. <laughs> That's good. I was going to say, I don't think uh, I don't think my boss would have been quite as understanding about to ring in and say, hey, I've just been flying myself around France for the last week and uh, I can't get back to work. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ross, t tell us about your, your US coast to coast flight. Um, wh where did you start from? Yes, we started in uh, Palm Beach, which is on the east coast of Florida. Um, Donald Trump kind of country at the moment. Um, thankfully, things were not quite so uh, disrupted back then. Um, yes, and actually I had a, a Michelin roadmap of the US, which I used to do my, uh, my large scale planning of where should we go today. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, set off up, uh, up through Florida and then uh, struck out west from, uh, from the top of Florida. Brilliant. Um, and, and it was really a case of we, we'd land at our destination at uh, the end of a day's flying and it was only at that point, really, that we'd then say, where should we go tomorrow? Uh, and we'd look at what the weather was doing and then we'd pick what looked like a nice flight. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. How long did that uh, journey actually take you from, from start to finish? Um, it was about five weeks total um, wow. from Florida out to California and then back again. Oh, you went back again? Yes. Yeah. Well, rental airplane, you've got to take it back. That's a, that's a <laughs> or, fair they get, or they get yeah, mad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How many flying hours did you rack up in, in, in that five weeks? Uh, that was 70 hours. Wow. Yeah. They, they were quite, uh, they were quite flexible about the daily minimums because um, they were, they had a very large fleet, which helped so they could let a, let a plane go for a while. Um, at, at the beginning of the trip, I'd thought to myself, well, America's about 3,000 miles across, I think. So let's call it 60 hours return, add 10 hours, and it'll probably be about 70 hours. And in well, the end, okay. it just coincidentally worked out to, I think, 70.5. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's not bad when you guesstimate and get a 0.5 out. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Luck of the draw. Love it. Absolutely love it. So how long was it then? You, you finished your coast to coast. How long was it then before you are planning your next adventure? Um, I, I think actually I'd already started thinking about it before finishing that one. We were having so much fun. Brilliant. Um, and, and, and really before we'd even finished, we said to ourselves, right, next time we've got to come back out and we've got to explore the Southwest of the U S more because that is just a stunning place to fly. Um, the, the scenery, the airport infrastructure, the little fields that you can just fly into and camp on. Um, it's, it's really a, an aviation paradise. Brilliant. I know Darren, the US is fantastic for all that. There's so much you can do out there. And there's a guy on um, YouTube that I follow called Trent Palmer. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> push pilot. And uh, he's in and out of strips that you've just described and stuff and going out camping and having barbecues and everything. And it looks like a really nice, it's something that's been on my bucket list for, for a while um, that I've wanted to do and some stuff around Florida as well. I don't know if you've ever done the um, shuttle run. Uh, I've flown over it, but I've not done the uh, low level flyby along the runway yet. That's, uh, it's definitely yeah, on that's... my bucket list. I think it's on every aviator's bucket list, isn't it? It's... I think it must be. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I think. So for th for those that that don't know what the, the shuttle run is, it's basically where you're you're given permission to do a low flyby along the uh, shuttle landing um, facility in Kennedy Space Center. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's something that I definitely really really want to do. So Ross, you then decided you're going to go and observe the Reno Air Races. How did that come about? Yeah, so that was a few years later, um, 2014, I think I did that. Um, and at the time, I was a member of a flying club in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, again, the Reno Air Races is something that I'd always been quite interested in seeing. Um, so I just decided, well, let's, uh, let's do it. Let's fly over and have a look. Um, I had a, a friend who was, lived in the area, a student pilot, and she was keen to go as well. Um, so we pulled our resources and jumped in the uh, club's Piper Arrow and headed out across uh, 
we, we decided that, that because we were flying all the way to uh, Reno, we might as well fly a little bit further and make it another coast to coast trip. Um, so we did head as far as California and see the ocean. Brilliant. Did you do that before you stopped off in Reno or afterwards? That was before, yeah. We went down through uh, New Mexico, kind of uh, southern route, um, stopped off in the town of Truth or Consequences, um, which I had seen on my road map on the first Coast to Coast flight back in uh, 2007 and thought to myself, I've got to go there one day because it has such a weird name. Definitely. And it turns out it's actually, um, I, I had images of it being named that because of some interesting gunslinger duel back in the days of the Old West or, or something like this. But no, it turns out that they renamed the town to Truth or Consequences in the 1950s, I think it was, um, as part of a competition um, launched by a game show of the same name. It was uh, slightly less exciting. <laughs> Just slightly, but I think if people have never heard of it, it's, you can it's tell still a cool story. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. So uh, then headed to California from there and then hit Reno on the way back. Brilliant. And is the Reno Air Race as exciting as everyone says? It absolutely is. It's uh, great fun. Um, I'm not sure whether I'd go for the, uh, the full week. Um, unless I was really into the racing, mm. but to go for a day or two is fantastic to uh, see the see the machines on static display on the ground, um, see some of the racing. Just the noise of these uh, these aircraft is stunning. <laughs> it's great because um, it, it's the only place where I've ever seen you can get a 10, 20 low level flying airplanes racing each other around a, a field essentially, and they Indeed. vary from anything from warbirds to to jets. Yes, yeah, I think it really is uh, pretty unique in the world, and, well, and yeah, ho hopefully say, it'll keep going. I don't know anywhere else that does it like that, except for except for Reno. Indeed, yeah, yeah, it's a pretty a very American thing. So then, you after that, you decided you were going to go up to the uh, Dakota Mountains um, and do do a bit of flying around there. That's right. Yeah. So at the at the end of the uh, at the end of the Reno trip, we actually came back and crashed the Piper Arrow at home base. Um, unfortunately, the uh, the landing gear would not come down. Oh no! Um, so that was a fun afternoon, circling for a couple of hours uh, while most of the population of the local town came and lined the uh, airport fence to see what today's entertainment was. Um, so yeah, the, the follow following year, uh, the same friend who who had been through the crash landing with me. Um, I say crash landing; it was really just a. Uh, a gear up landing pretty straightforward what did you do just shut the engine down and just just slide it in no uh, i kept the engine on until um until basically i was in the flare um there were, i had about 10 police cars there eight fire engines um, various other people buzzing around and i thought to myself it would be really dumb to shut down a perfectly operating engine on final approach um, just to have someone then drive onto the runway at the wrong moment and not be able to go around. Agreed. And it, the airplane's insured, so the most important thing is, is looking after the occupants. Any landing you can walk away from. Precisely, precisely. But yeah, so then we headed out to uh, the Dakotas the uh, following year in, in a fixed gear Cessna 172 um, to, to avoid the ribbing from the flying club. Um, with uh, yes, the the same friend from the previous year and uh, a friend of mine from university, um, and we chose the Dakotas really because it was an empty spot on the map where none of us had ever been, um, and and people don't tend to go. So we thought, oh, let's go and see what's out there, um, and it was a thoroughly interesting trip. Brilliant, brilliant. Because this is all slowly building you up. Because obviously you're, you're three quarters of the around the world, so. I'm taking it every, every time you're, you're leaving base and doing a trip like this, you're starting to gain experience for this trip. That's right, yeah. And, and the, the previous trips I had done that, that really gave me the most experience were my, my flight to Tunisia, which I touched upon uh, earlier. And, and the following year, 2011, uh, we took a, uh, a little nose wheel mall down to Egypt, um, to Luxor in the south. And, and just those experience of flying across international borders into some slightly out of the way countries in terms of GA uh, were worth their weight in gold. Um, and, and those, of course, led up to my uh, large flight through Africa in 2013. Brilliant. T tell us a bit about that flight. Yes. So um, in early 2013, on uh, there's an aviation forum, the 
International Pilots Rumour Network, which I'm sure you're familiar with. I saw a posting on there by a British senior obstetric surgeon, and she was particularly keen to combat maternal mortality in Africa during childbirth, um, which was one of the millennium development goals um, they'd set at the time to try and reduce that. Uh, I believe it was the United Nations had set those. So she was putting together a charity project to travel through as many of the countries in Africa as possible that were doing the worst in terms of maternal mortality, um, provide training to local doctors and mostly to set up long-term links between Europe and the US and then physicians in these more challenging locations to help with training and, and equipment donations and so on. And she determined that really the only practical way to get to all these little remote areas, as well as large international cities and everything in between, was by general aviation. Um, initially, she was looking for some advice on what type of aircraft to take and, and other issues she might face. So I stepped in and helped her out a bit with my, my limited African experience at that point. And a few weeks before she was due to set off, she said to me, well, I still don't have a pilot. Will you come and fly it for me? What an offer. So uh, I, I couldn't say no. Um, so off we went for four months. We uh, visited 26 different countries in Africa. Um, at everything from the kind of met metropolis of Lagos down to uh, tiny little villages in West Darfur in Sudan. Um, and, and it was some incredible flying and just an incredible experience outside of that. That's fantastic. And we, we talked to Kerry McCauley, who was a, um, a ferry pilot a couple of weeks ago and he did he starred on uh, dangerous flights and stuff and he was telling me a little bit about flying to africa we were like everywhere you land they're always looking for a bit of a bit of a bit of a bribe as to say more more added on to the landing fee did you find any of that when you were flying through much less than i had expected okay. um it, it was on, uh, only one location that we ended up having to pay a bit of a bribe um in in port harcourt in nigeria and even then, we talked them down from a $100 request to $6. Um, <laughs> I, I think a large part of what helped was we were there as a medical charity mission. Okay. Um, and I think in a lot of these areas, people actually would have felt a bit bad trying to uh, shake you down for money. Whereas if you're going through as a commercial operator, then yeah, it's, it's fair game. Yeah, yeah. But when you're turning up and you're actually going out into the community and trying to help... Uh, help the members of the community I, I think you're welcomed generally with open arms and, and people tend to not try and take advantage of you brilliant and for that trip are you flying under un colors or anything like that um not specifically we were hosted by the un in darfur um when we went there um and we were flying kind of under the colors of the international uh, gynecological organization um so Pretty much everywhere we went, there were physicians on the ground who were meeting us and helping us out. Brilliant. So it, it, it wasn't, you, you had the kind of a support group with you as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so in the aircraft, it was, it was just me and uh, this Dr. Webster. Um, but yes, in, in most of the locations, she had made contact in advance with, with local physicians, hospitals and the like. Um, there were a couple of places where really it was just a case of, of turn up and try and figure out what's happening. But most places we at least had someone to contact on arrival. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. It sounds like it was it was an awesome trip and, and kind of, you, you helped out massively by, by doing the trip as well. So it was it worked in both favours, if you know what I mean. Absolutely, yeah. It was really nice to fly with a purpose. Brilliant. So now let's let's move on to your current purpose so th this is the big <laughs> this is the big thing this is uh you you're you're flying around the world basically in a, in a single engine piston aircraft that's right how did you get the notion to do this again this really had its genesis back in the days of uh of my ppl and even my uh, uh my flight simulator days um i'd flown around the world on flight simulator so, so once i had my my proper license, um, it, it was an obvious final step to aim for. 
while I was training, I, I got in my head that there were three real adventures that I that I would like to do. Um, I wanted to fly coast to coast across the US, uh, which we spoke about. Um, my, my second aim was to try and fly the length of Africa, um, which I was then able to do with uh, this charity flight, the, the flight for every mother, it was called. And, and the final one was really to fly around the world. Um, which, which is about as, as big as you can get when it comes to a flying adventure. Oh, yeah. Um, and I ended up at a stage where my, my job gave me the time to do it. Um, I had managed to uh, obtain an aircraft that would be able to do it. And, and really, I had to seize the moment and go for it. Brilliant. And how much planning was there before you could set off? Because you've, you've done 174 airports already, so you've... You had, have you had a look into these or were they just a spur of the moment I need to land there kind of thing? A um, bit of variety. So the, the planning really started, I would say, back in 2009, 2010 kind of time when actually I answered an advertisement from someone on this same internet forum I mentioned earlier looking for a co-pilot to fly their Cessna 182 around the world with them. And, and we got quite far into the planning um, before this lady then decided that actually she didn't want to fly around the world anyway which was disappointing. Um, Very disappointing, I can imagine. But, but, but it meant at least I had a bit of a head start on, uh, I had an idea of what needed to be organized in terms of equipment, in terms of the route, um, all this kind of thing. I, I bought the aircraft at the beginning of 2018, um, really with this trip in mind. Um, in that summer, I, I did a few modifications to it. Um, added the the wingtip fuel tanks for example and then headed off on a six-week trip up through alaska and northern canada uh, wow we, we flew as far north as eureka um, in canada which is about 600 miles from the north pole oh wow um which is quite strange to be surrounded by snow and ice in august <laughs> But it was it was a great shakedown tour for the aircraft and for me to really know, OK, these are the things I want to do to it before I try and take it off around the world. Um, and then, yes, before leaving in May 2019, um, which was the start of the trip, there was a, probably a good year of really intense planning um, in terms of preparing the aircraft and then starting to figure out the, uh, the appropriate stops, working out where there was avgas. Uh, all the regulations, permits, and so on. Brilliant. How did your first leg go? Because your first leg was you, you were crossing the Atlantic in, in a single engine aircraft. That's right. Yeah. Um, first time I'd ever done something like that, but somehow the insurance company was still okay with it, which was nice. Um, I, I met up. Home, with, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I met up with uh, the same friend from the Dakotas flight. Um, he flew into uh, Canada. Um, we met up in Toronto and then he flew with me um, and it was a remarkably smooth trip. The, um, the distances for crossing the North Atlantic are actually not too far. I think our longest flight was six hours, okay. um, which by, by usual typical PPL standard is quite long, but compared to the 12, 18 hour flights uh, across the Pacific, it's, it's pretty short. Um, but, but the weather is the real challenge. Um, we got quite lucky. We were only delayed by one day because of weather. Okay. In the end, that was uh, trying to leave Goose Bay in Canada and head across to Greenland. Um, uh, apart from that, we hit a really nice high pressure, which uh, took us the vast majority of the way without any trouble. Brilliant. And have you got ferry tanks on board the aircraft as well to help people longer distance? That's right, yeah. So it's a, it's a Cessna 182, a 1981 model. Um, it's got 92-gallon, U.S. gallon uh, mains. Then we've got another 24 US gallons in the tip tanks. Um, and then I've removed the rear seats and replaced those with a 160 gallon turtle pack flexible ferry tank. Wow. So in total, there's about 20 hours of endurance. Wow, so it's nearly a full day's flying right there. And exactly. And, and really there is only one leg of the entire trip where I will need to fill all the tanks. What leg is that? That's from Hawaii to California. Wow which is 2,100 nautical miles and I expect it to take about 17 hours. Wow, I'm going to jump to that for a second. We're going to skip the other phases and just go to the <laughs> for a second because you hear everyone talk about, yeah, single engine pissing across the Atlantic. 
I have never heard of anyone bigging up a single engine piston across the Pacific, which, though it might be slightly warmer, like you said, is <laughs> a massive mileage. Indeed, yes. Now, single engine piston do fly this route more often than you'd think. Okay. Um, aircraft are ferried to and from Australia and New Zealand um, for, for deliveries. But it's not very common. Um, and, and these days, I think people tend to go around the Pacific Rim a bit more up through Japan, Russia, and into Alaska. Um, Avgas availability can be a real challenge, um, trying to get hold of fuel on, on a couple of these little islands in the middle. Um, sometimes they have fuel, sometimes they don't. So it's you're well advised to buy your fuel six months or a year in advance to make sure it's waiting there for you. Brilliant. And then, of course, that, that works out in almost every situation um, other than global pandemic, which suddenly means you've got all this half gas sitting on an island in the Pacific and you're not allowed in. Oh, uh, no. So we'll, 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 we'll come back to, to the global pandemic bit. Um, <laughs> Indeed. But so you, once you've made it across the, the Atlantic, what was your next stop? Or, did, where, or where did you stop? Um, so we, I spent a bit of time in the United Kingdom. Um, flying around. Uh, my father actually met me in Aberdeen and then flew down uh, through the country with me back uh, to Kent. Brilliant. Um, and I was then met by my partner and we spent uh, a week or so flying around the UK. Um, and from there headed out uh, to the Netherlands, um, Germany, the Czech Republic, Austria, um, and across then into real Eastern Europe um, to Romania and the Black Sea. Wow, I'd say so. I'd say that was an amazing trip all down through Europe and everything. Yes, yeah, that was really, really nice flying. Um, countries I hadn't been to before, in terms of Hungary, um, Bulgaria, Romania, um, and they were all remarkably nice places to fly. Uh, very reasonable fees, decent airports. Um, so, so I'd certainly go back and I, I'd recommend it to people who were looking to fly a bit further afield. Brilliant. So what, my understanding of it is at the moment that your current situation, your aircraft is in Australia um, and you're, you're in the, the, the US. So wait, how, first of all, how did you get the, the aircraft into, into Australia? Um, so I, got, I arrived in Australia well before the COVID pandemic began. Um, that was September of 2019. Um, spent a bit of time in Australia, and then at the beginning of 2020, flew across to New Zealand. Um, and it was while I was in New Zealand that the pandemic hit, and everything just had to, to come to a halt for quite some time. Um, I was able to start flying again um, around about August of 2020, and I spent a few months exploring New Zealand, before the, uh, the Australians opened up the uh, border one way, so you could fly from New Zealand to Australia, but you couldn't go back again. Okay. Um, but I thought to myself, well, let's, let's go back to Australia. It's such a vast place, and I'd only scratched the surface beforehand. So uh, I decided to go back and, and fly around Australia a bunch more and, and see, uh, see more of what that had to offer. Brilliant. Uh, it, it was a good opportunity, actually. There was a little bit of a silver lining out of COVID. Yeah, <laughs> to, to see a lot more of those countries. Brilliant. I was going to say because it, it, when, you, when you've got the time, you might as well use it and not waste it. And if you're putting the hours in the logbook, but also seeing things that people with only Sky Television can only dream of seeing, you know, it, it really adds up. Uh, precisely. Yeah, yeah. It's a real. It, it, it's a corny phrase, but it, it really is a bit of a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so, you, at what point did you decide? I need to go back home and, and leave the airplane behind. Um, it was really, I'd always planned, well, a post pandemic anyway, <laughs> planned that I, I would come back um, for, for work and family reasons no later than the beginning of December last year. Um, and, and now really I'll, I'll be waiting, I think, until the Pacific Islands open up and I can go back down and, and perform that final section of the flight. So the aircraft is hangered now. Uh, the engine has been properly preserved for long-term inactivity, and it's a bit of a waiting game. Brilliant. And is it, are Australian government and all that, they're, they're happy for the aircraft to, to stay there until 
further notice? Um, no, nobody has said anything to me yet. <laughs> so I'm going for a little bit of a don't ask, don't tell approach. Brilliant. Um, but, but everyone seems to have a bit more flexibility around COVID these days. Um, I, and I think they well understand that uh, there's nowhere that it's possible to fly to. Um, so outside of taking off the wings and putting it in a container, which I really don't want to do. Yeah. Um, uh, no, nobody has yet had a problem with it. Brilliant. And how, what's, what's your next leg then? Where, where from Australia, where are you going to head to? So originally, um, I was planning to strike out from New Zealand to cross the Pacific. So the beginning of the trip um, of, of this leg will be slightly different. Um, I'll probably head out of the Brisbane area um, and fly to New Caledonia, and then across to American Samoa, and then up to uh, Kiritimati, um, which is also known as Christmas Island. Oh, yeah. Um, there's more than one Christmas Island in the world, confusingly. Oh, okay. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and from there up to Hawaii. Brilliant. And then Hawaii on to, on to California. Yeah, then it's the big leg to California. Um, and from there, it's just easy flying through the US. No worries. Brilliant. And where, where's the aircraft base? Like, where, where did you start from? Where's your final stop? I started from uh, Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. So that'll be where I finish up again. Um, it, it's no longer where the aircraft is based, but it's, it is the starting and ending point of the trip. Um, I spent a few years living there, so I have a, a lot of friends, uh, particularly in the aviation community, Brilliant. Uh, which made it a really good, uh, good start and finish point. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say once you start from there, you, you have to finish it as well, don't you? Absolutely, yeah, pretty much locked in at that stage. <laughs> yeah, I remember when um, myself, and my dad, we did a round Britain Michael rally in 2011, I think it was, for a BBC Two documentary. We got as far as we were coming home. We finished the rally. We got as far as into Blundell, just outside Liverpool, and the weather had turned, and we were just we were hot, nearly a helicopter. We were burning fuel, but not gaining any mileage. So we said, <laughs> okay. "Dan needs to be back for work. I need to be back for school at the time." So we're like, "All right, okay." Um, we we'll leave the airplane, but uh, there was that thing of we we had to go over together to to go and get the airplane to finish the what what we started and fly it back to our home strip. Just indeed, left our home strip, gone on holiday, <laughs> got our passport stamped, and come back. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's like you were saying, actually, with the GA stuff, cross border and everything like that. Um, there's something great about flying yourself to a different country and having to get out and have your passport stamped. There is, yeah. It's uh, it, it's a really satisfying thing to do. Um, yeah. Speaking of passports, it's funny crossing the uh, from the US to the yeah to beyond the UK. I think as far as Germany, uh, only one person asked to look at my passport on that entire route. <laughs> <laughs> I love it because they're all meant to be uh, with customs and everything, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. No, they were remarkably trusting. Um, <laughs> For some reason, departing the Faroe Islands, they they were really keen to see my passport. Um, okay. But but apart from that, no nobody even asked for it. Wow, I, I, that's mad. <laughs> and and nobody has looked inside the aircraft at all throughout the entire trip, apart from a lady in Bulgaria who wanted to take a picture of the instrument panel. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't even official. It was it was just for her own use. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And how long is it going to take you now to finish? I let, let, Let's say COVID's gone in the morning, you're heading back out now. How long is it going to take from when you take off again to when you're finishing Pittsburgh? Yeah. It's going to depend a little bit on how much the islands open up. Um, if it's possible, I'd like to spend a few days on each of these islands to, to see a bit of them as I go through. Because um, it's probably not many times in my life I'm going to fly to Kiritimati in the Pacific. Yeah. Um, it would seem a shame to land there in the evening and just take off the next morning after seeing nothing but a hotel. If um, So I'd expect probably a three-week trip, um, if it's possible to stop in some of these places. If not, then it would, and, and if the weather cooperated, it would really be uh, probably under a week. Okay, that's that's quite quick. Yeah, it's only a few flights. They just happen to be very long ones. <laughs> Over a lot, a lot of wet stuff. Yes. And how are you getting sponsorship, Ross, or how, how are you funding the trip? No. Um, so really, it's just uh, from savings. Um, 
yeah, yeah, many years of savings. Um, I've had friends join me for some sections, um, and, and they've chipped in to help with the cost. Um, I, I am ra raising a bit of money through sponsorship, um, and all of that goes to the charity that I'm choosing to support, which is Brilliant. called African Promise. And they, uh, they support primary school education in Kenya. Oh, wow. What a charity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, they have a very long term view. Um, they're very low overhead. Um, and I've, I've been watching them for quite a while, which is why I selected them as a, a charity to support. But it's very much a case of every single penny that gets donated goes to the charity. None of it is used for funding the trip. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. And because it's, it's a big thing, like if you manage to get the media behind you and stuff like that, you could you could really push this. Absolutely. That was the idea. Um, I, I was setting off to do this trip anyway. And I really thought to myself, well, I, I should use this um, to try and, and raise some money for a decent cause as well. Brilliant. Because um, it would be a shame to waste the opportunity. No, 100 percent. Like like you said, the opportunities are rife out there, like with the, with the flying and the seeing things. And why not do a, a really, really good cause at the same time? Absolutely. When when you get back uh, from from your trip, what what's your plans? Because I understand you you have a commercial pilot license as well. I do, yes. Um, and I I had always thought to myself, if uh, if the oil and gas work, which I do um, as a day job, go, goes down, I can go and work as a pilot because cheap oil always means lots of demand for flying. Again, until the pandemic came and they both crashed at once. Um, oh, no. so, so that plan <laughs> was turned out not to survive contact with the enemy. Um, <laughs> I can see for the foreseeable future that I'll remain uh, a pilot for pleasure only. Um, but I already have a few ideas about uh, adventures that I'd like to do next. Um, one of which would involve trying to fly to Antarctica. Oh, wow. That would be a good one. It would be uh, very exciting. So we'll see how that develops. Brilliant. And do you plan on using the same aircraft or are you, you looking at Yes, one? yes. I mean, I've I've done so much to this aircraft and got it set up just the way I want it to. It's, it's really the perfect plane for this kind of adventure. So I, I think I'll be hanging on to this for a long time to come. Fantastic. I was going to say, I have a little bit of experience with a, with a Cessna 182 and that's a... Uh, we had a we had a skydive one, but I don't know if you're familiar with any with any jump planes. But they're mainly years old and uh, held together with with duct tape on the inside. <laughs> yes, yeah, I've seen a few, and uh, yeah, I, I I try and keep mine uh, in, in slightly better nick than that. <laughs> Brilliant! You've even got, uh, you got four skydivers clambering around it, wrecking it on you. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. I know the skydive ones are usually fantastic mechanically, um, but cosmetically they leave a little to be desired. When you're sitting it for 17 hours, you want a little bit more comfort. I can imagine that. Yeah, we, we got a, oh, it was very funny one time. We had a, a Cessna two, a Turbine 206 um, in, in, in the parachute club. My, I was brought up on the, on the Irish Parachute Club. And uh, back, I think it was 2008, 2009 time, we got our hands on a Turbine 206. And uh, one of the lads who was who was training to fly it at the time, he was one of our jump pilots on the Platas Porter and the One A Two, and um, he discovered that the rails uh, for the seat it, it was a lovely seat, lovely sheepskin leather. You sink into it kind <laughs> of thing and it eats you up. Um, he discovered that it was the same width of a rail uh, as his car was, and he came up with this perfect plan of being able to slot it into the car rather than have the actual <laughs> original car seats in there. <laughs> perfect why not <laughs> it's gonna say when, when you're taking five seats out of a six-seater airplane you might as well put them to use you might as well yeah waste not want not <laughs> brilliant ross it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and i wish you all the best with your um expeditions that, that, that you've, you've got to go on and hopefully when you finish this one we, we can get you on again and and chat chat about how your your last legs have gone thanks very much mike yeah that sounds like a good plan to me and it's been great fun talking with you Brilliant. And you, Ross, have a good one. You too.